money, you bastard! You Three years ago, a trailer for Crunchyroll's first original series hit the internet, and the response was infamously hostile. It was a perfect storm of sweaty anime cum brains, anti-SJW influencers, a general distaste of Crunchyroll, and me. In everyone's defense, this was a bad decision. Albeit a seemingly harmless taste of what's to come, it was probably Crunchyroll's attempt at cementing their future as a producer, and not just a distributor. Nevertheless, people ripped it apart. They hated the cast, they hated the crew, and they hated everything about the concept. So, like a good multinational corporation, Crunchyroll shelved it. Three years later, High Guardian Spice finally releases on Crunchyroll. So, on October 26th, me and my friends came together to watch this absolute train wreck of a show and learn from its terrible, terrible mistakes. Unfortunately... Say goodnight, motherfucker! We're back! to the fact zone. Maturity is something I think no one expected from High Guardian Spice, not only because of its concept, but because the West is currently being consumed by this era of esoteric adventure time fanfiction. Still have nightmares. It's not a bad assumption to look at this trailer and this intro and conclude that it's just another one of these, but it's kind of not. The very first thing you see in every episode of Spice is this warning. Strong language, violence, sex, <laughs> holy shit, what? She's a lush who never met a deckhand she didn't deck. Well, no one's gonna top that. This caught a lot of people off guard, and they're right to be confused. Nothing about the marketing indicated this. And for the longest time, we were anticipating some kind of holy shit twist that took the show in an entirely different direction. That never really happened, but we were surprised in a different way. Okay, that's actually crazy. High Guardian Spice is about maturity. And it's not just violence or cursing or references to sex. Those things are in Spice, Don't. but they're not paltry, quirky moments like in other productions. They serve a greater theme of maturity in both the characters and the setting. There's blood and violence in the first half of the show, and it's mostly in respect to fighting monsters or being naive. But in the second half of the show, a lot of things begin to ramp up. There's stronger language, stronger enemies, higher stakes, and a constant reminder of mortality. Blood and gore begin dominating every encounter, and protagonists or not, people are constantly coming face to face with death. These seemingly isolated situations aren't peril for the sake of peril, they have a profound effect on the way characters think and act. Which, contrary to modern examples, is what character development actually is. Don't talk shit about Owl House, I'll kill you! By the end, Rosemary, Sage, Parsley, and Time look similar enough to their first outing, but in many respects, they simply aren't the same. They've gone through some intense shit, whether it's constantly facing their own mortality or evolving emotionally through interpersonal conflict, they grow from naive, daydreaming children into wiser, stronger, and more cynical adults. And those moments aren't random inconveniences that are promptly forgotten. Not only do they inform the way they think and act later, but a lot of the mature moments in this show are consequences of their childish, irresponsible actions. The team goes into a dungeon, and Rosemary asks Sage to drop the Queen of the Creatures on top of her so she can stab it in the gut. Not only is it a proficiently violent moment, but her brash, irresponsible decision leads to her getting her own stomach sliced open, and as a result, she nearly dies from the blood loss. Yeah, 
Rosemary being more careful is a recurring theme for her character, if not an obvious deduction from her archetype, then certainly foreshadowed by her breaking her mother's sword. It's subsequently fixed because in a lot of ways it already was broken, but so is she. It's like Gandalf said, some wounds never heal, and that's how people grow. In episode 11, the team gets turned into mermaids, and it's a really girly moment because it's apparently every girl's fucking dream or something. I don't know, something something hyperborea. Spaghetti, why do women want to be mermaids? <laughs> What? But after fighting something they were supposed to capture, Sage mortally wounds it by accident, and when it washes ashore, they decide to put it down. Huh? See, normally there'd be a MacGuffin that revives the creature and disavows them from any responsibility for their actions. A la, wait, we don't have to do that, but nope. We're just gonna kill them. And that's something that traumatizes both of them. It's tonal whiplash, but it works because that's what the show's about. Very early on, Parsley has a pretty awful disagreement with her parents about going to High Guardian Academy. She, and in a lot of respects time as well, are in the inverse position of having to grow up early. She has 13 siblings, and it's too much work for her parents to handle, so they want her to finish trying out school and getting back to helping them in the forge. But Parsley doesn't want that. She wants to be reckless and childlike, and she learns to do that in places like the obstacle course. She has a hammer. It was meant to build things, but like a child, now she just wants to wreck shit. But at the same time, that recklessness just gets her turned to stone at the Autumn Processional. Actions have consequences. The childish whims and inexperience that the protagonists have fails them, and it's through their failings that they evolve into smarter, better people. There's also that whole point in the last episode about sunbathing and cloudy weather, which is a pretty apt metaphor for these kids' journeys. Everyone in the cast goes through something like this. It's true that High Guardian Spice explores LGBT themes, and a lot of people disagree with how it's portrayed here because they're never satisfied and want to be angry at everything. But not only are there two very obvious trans people in this show, one of whom stares directly at the camera and says the words, I'm, I'm transgender, transgender, which is eons more than Disney's passive progressivism. <laughs> but the other one is pre-transition, and throughout the story goes from this wimpy sidekick to someone who not only embraces who they are, but finds their strength through self-confidence. People online getting hung up on minutia, like transition magic, is so nitpicky. Like, I'm sorry, are two trans people not enough for you? There's also obviously the group of people that dislike having trans characters in general, and I'm not gonna say anything about them because they don't deserve attention. <laughs> Snapdragon and the Professor aren't the only background characters to evolve, though. Don't worry, I'm here! Amaryllis is the school bully for a couple of episodes, which is a role befitting her snarky, aggressive personality. Her journey in supporting Snapdragon is messy, but so is she. And not only does she embrace the new Snapdragon, but she grows from this abrasive, angry person into a leader that empathizes with her peers instead of constantly knocking them down. Shut up! This moment where they switch weapons is also pretty neat. Both of them are defying their family's legacy and forging their own path. I mean, for God's sake, the headmaster of the academy is the same person in three different stages of their life. I actually don't think that's true. The show is about maturity, about growing up, learning from your mistakes, becoming who you were meant to be. And that's not lip service that you can attach to any old story like a metaphor. It's a critical part of every character, every arc, and every episode. And that is leagues above the esoteric, dialogue-heavy cartoons that we call animation today.
A show about maturity naturally draws criticism from people who have no understanding of it whatsoever. So I think it's a beautiful irony that High Guardian Spice's loudest critics aren't people who make an attempt to enjoy the show, or, or even people who actually watched it beginning to end, but are people who already decided that they were gonna hate it three years ago. Anime fans are being especially vicious towards this production, and for what? Does mediocre trans discourse in a children's cartoon really warrant this rabid hostility? Did Crunchyroll murder your fucking dog or something? These kinds of people aren't interested in constructive conversation. They're petty, tween-brained morons who act like they're on a playground when they touch a keyboard. They wouldn't know maturity if it fucked them in the eye. Wow, that sounds very violent. So instead of pretending to be smug about something you literally don't care about on Twitter, why don't you just watch it and form your own goddamn opinions? Or does that not fit into your busy schedule of retweeting other people's opinions? Listen, America, don't get me wrong. The show isn't perfect. The trailers and intro sequence aren't great for this kind of story, and part of me thinks maturity as a theme might have been unintentional. It's not tweening animation, which makes it automatic better, but it is pretty rough, and there aren't these great money shots like there are in AAA productions like The Owl House, so I'm a little split there. Any complaints about bad voice acting are automatically mute because Slime Boy exists. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Also, obviously, I'm pro-LGBT, but I know next to nothing about what constitutes as realistic, so maybe this whole I'm transgender scene really is weird and I just don't see it. But honestly, if I was a kid, I, love children. I would do everything in my power to watch this show. That warning might seem overboard, not only did they change it, but I'd contend it just makes the idea of watching it more attractive. If nothing else, and all of this is just pretentious extrapolation, it's gruesome, they swear, Asshole. they make sex jokes, and there's a really cute cat lady. For some of you, that's probably all I had to say in this video, so I'll leave it at that. Good job, Ray. Don't listen to Twitter. You did an excellent job. Make a second season. Which city is Ishgard and Arthas is coming to town!